All right. Um, let's turn there. Um, I'm not sure what page that's on. 54, thank you. 54 in the back of your hymnals. And since we are covering the Eighth Commandment uh, now uh, for this worship service, obviously it's appropriate that uh, we would read um, these two questions and the answers to those two questions from the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, so question uh, 110, and uh, I'll read the question, and if you respond um, with the answer, and I'm assuming you don't have to read all the scripture citations, right? Okay, uh, so people of God, what does God forbid in the Eighth Commandment? He forbids not only outright theft and robbery, punishable by law, but in God's sight, theft also includes cheating and swindling our neighbor by schemes to appear legitimate, such as inaccurate measurements of weights, size, or volume, fraudulent merchandising, counterfeit money, excessive interest, or any other means forbidden by God. In addition, he also forbids of greed and pointless squandering of his gifts. People of God, what does God require of you in this commandment? That I do whatever I can for my neighbor's good, that I treat him as I would like others to treat me, and that I work faithfully so that I may share with those in need. All right. There are, if, if you haven't realized this, there are many ways in which we confess what we believe in worship. And uh, we do so through the catechisms and the creeds. We do so when we sing. When we sing, we are just confessing what we believe to be true, but we just set it to music. Um, so that also is a confession of our faith. We've confessed our sins, and we confess that God forgives us of our sins as well. So I bring that to your attention just because a lot of times we think that confession of faith is kind of limited to only when we read certain things in worship. But the fact that we're here this morning and not outside uh, doing all kinds of other fun things, that's a confession of our faith in Jesus Christ, that we confess that we want to be with God and his people on a Sunday morning. Uh, so we are constantly confessing our faith in Jesus Christ, whether we realize it or not. The very act of being here is a confession of that faith in him who saved us. Um, if you would turn back again to Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. Um, we've confessed through the catechism what we believe the Eighth Commandment uh, to be, and we're just going to study it this uh, morning uh, a little bit more. But back to Exodus 20, we're just going to read again um, just verse 15. It's a short one, uh, but we'll find that it's, uh, it encompasses all of our life again. So Exodus 20, 15. You shall not steal. You shall not steal. Let's pray and ask that God would uh, once again, bless us with uh, enlightenment, illumination that we need from him. Let's pray. Holy, just, perfect God, Father, we come to you. And again, we, we have a prayer request, Father, to put before you. Um, Father, you have given us your law. You have promised that it is for our good always. And Father, we ask that today we would believe that, that promise. That as we study together, as we meditate together your law, that we would see you for who you are, see ourselves for who we are, and that we would see Christ for who he is. And Father, we ask that we would leave this place delighting in your law, that it would not be a burden or merely a duty in our lives, but it would be our delight to fulfill it, to obey it through our Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, open up our hearts. Father, 
uh, create in us a desire for your law. Father, create in us something that does not come from within us, create in us, God, a joy over your law, that we might be like our Savior, that we might obey with joy and thankfulness and gratitude towards you. Father, we ask this uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, the commandments, you should know, I'm sure some of you have studied this already, but there are three basic things that the Ten Commandments show us. Uh, they show us God's holiness. They show us our sinfulness. And they show us what I can only term, because I've been thinking about this, but there's no other way for me to put this. They show us Christ's, they show us Jesus' awesomeness. Because the law doesn't just stop with showing us how holy God is and how sinful we are. But the law of God was really meant to be a tool for God's people, that it would drive us ultimately to Jesus. I know sometimes we come to God's law and we think that God has only given us those laws to make us feel bad. That's part of what it does, right? It's, it should cause us to stop, examine ourselves, even as believers, especially as believers, and realize we still need God's grace. And it should drive us always back to Jesus. All right? So please, in your own lives and in your own even interactions with each other, don't use the law of God merely to make others feel bad or to remind them how lowly they are, but the law of God is really meant as God meant it to be, to drive us, take us to Jesus and embrace him anew and afresh every time. Um, that is, by the way, the only way that, that the law can be a delight to us. There, there's no way that God's law, that any rules that God gives us can be um, pleasurable to us if we don't first go through Jesus. There's no way that a lawbreaker like me, can find love and joy for the lawgiver and his law if I don't go first to the law keeper, Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. There is no way for a lawbreaker to love the lawgiver and his law without first going to the law keeper, which is Jesus Christ. So this morning, as we go through the Eighth Commandment and kind of dig deep into it, I believe it's the shortest commandment of all, um, that as we do that, that we would be thinking, how does this take me to Jesus? How can this take others to Jesus? So we're just going to dive right in. Um, not going to cite any movies this time or any references to stories. We're just going to dive right in. Um, we read in our... Uh, the catechism that, if you notice, the catechism asks two questions. What does God forbid and what does God require? That's a very um, important principle for us to, to keep in mind as we study the Ten Commandments. Um, our fathers in the faith, our brothers in the faith, a long time ago during Reformation, realized that, that God, it, when he gives a commandment, he always forbids something and he requires something. That is to say that even though a commandment, especially in the Ten Commandments, even though a commandment is stated in the negative, there's also a positive aspect that God requires of us. All right, and we're, we're going to study what God uh, forbids, what God speaks against, and what God speaks uh, in favor of as well. Um, for those of you who have studied Ten Commandments, here's another principle for you to study. It's very easy. Uh, especially um, for those of us who, who have small minds, like me. Um, the Ten Commandments really can be boiled down to two commandments, right? And Jesus spoke of this in the New Testament. The first four commandments deal with loving who? God. And the last six commandments deal with loving who? Others, right? So it's really just an explanation of those two commandments. And it's super interesting to find out and maybe think and meditate, why does God only give us four commandments 
on how we should love him, but he gives us six on how we should love other people. We might think that God would give us nine commandments on how to love him, and then only one to love others, but it's not what he does. Four are just specifically directed on how we should love God, glorify, worship God, praise him, and then six go into detail about how we should love our neighbor. I think it's because, in one way, all the commandments deal with loving God and, and who he is. And we, 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 uh, we didn't cover this in the first service, but um, we're told in Genesis 1 that God created Adam and Eve and that they bear, they reflect, they have inside of them his image. All right. So it's not like God is giving us six commandments on how to love other creatures, like how to love um, dogs or cats. Right? He's given us six commandments on how to love a very particular creature, which is the human. Right? Because humans, you and I, were made in God's image. So when God gives us ten commandments and four of them are directed specifically at him, the other six are not removed from him. The other six are meant to show us how we should love those who bear his image, those that carry part of him into this creation. All right? So God is not only jealous for how we love him, but how we love those who reflect him to the rest of creation. And you should know this, that God takes his image in you that seriously. That you are not an animal. That you are the best kind of creature that God's ever created. Because you are a reflection of him to this world. That's why God gives us, I think, six commandments. Because he's so concerned about his image in us and in the world. Right? And so when we go through the last six commandments, commandment 5 through 10, we should ask ourselves, what specifically about God's image is being spoken of in this commandment? I'll give you an example. In the fifth commandment, we're told that we are to honor our fathers and our mothers, right? Why? Why? How, how does a father and a mother reflect God in this world? We can think of all kinds of things, right? God himself refers to him mostly as a father to us, his children. And God sometimes even refers to how he loves us in, in terms of a mother, right? And to a child, a father and a mother represent not just authority, but also safety, right, and provision, So parents reflect something of God to their children and to the rest of the world, right? Very easy, right? So I want you to think of in these commandments, when God is telling us to love our neighbor, what is it, something in that neighbor, in my other humans, that that may be reflecting God, and God is jealous to protect that part of them, in them. In this commandment, the eighth commandment, God is telling us, God is protecting everyone's right Uh, God-given right, I think, to owning things. All right. God owns everything, by the way, if you haven't figured that out. (laughs) He owns you. He owns me. He he created everything, and therefore he, he, it's his uh, right to have ownership over everything. All right. Um, uh, I'll get back to this, but, you know, when, when someone invents something, I used to be a mechanical engineer, and some of my coworkers had patents on their walls. All right? The U.S. government would give them a patent saying, you are an inventor, literally. Uh, you are an inventor, and you created something, you designed it, you made it, it's yours, no one else can claim it as their own. God created everything. He has a patent on everything around us. He has all the patents, um, and so he owns everything. That ownership is reflected in us. Now, God gives us these things, right? It's a gift, but he says, this is yours. I'm giving it to you. You own this, all right? Um, if you, and I think every person that's made in the image of God, we, we are given this, this uh, blessing, this privilege of owning things. You have the right to own things because you were made in God's image who owns all things. In Genesis 1, we're told that God made man, and then he gave him dominion over the earth. 
Now things obviously went, went the wrong way afterwards, right? Because as we read in Genesis 3, even though man had dominion over all things and was to take care of it, um, that things, that the earth even itself started falling apart. All right, the earth itself started falling apart. Man hasn't taken good care of all things. Um, let me just say on this one very fine and small point that a lot of the environmentalists get some things right. The world is messed up because of, of what humans have done to it. What they don't understand is that the earth is actually a lot worse off than they could ever imagine. Because the earth is not just polluted physically, but spiritually as well. And it is our fault, Genesis 3, by the way. And they need to know the creator and not just get in touch with creation, right? So we with them would agree, yes, it's our fault that the world is messed up. And you and I are constantly not taking good care of the things that God has given to us, the earth included. And we need to run to the creator and we need to run to the one who can recreate us so that we can better steward and manage the things he's given to us. Um, so let me just set that up. God is protecting in this commandment part of himself in us. God owns all things. He's given us the privilege to own and to take care of some of, what, uh, some of the things on this earth. And he's protecting your neighbor's right to bear that image. That's why you can't just go off and steal things from them that God has given to them, right, and claim them as your own. Um, before we move on, let me just ask, do you believe that of your neighbor? Do you believe that your neighbor bears God's image in them? Even non-believer, do you respect them as the, the pinnacle of God's creation? You know, this whole idea of freedom for all, and liberty, and that we were all created equal. That wasn't a new idea to the founding fathers of this country. They got that from the Bible. And God is in the business of protecting humans, right? Of protecting their rights because he created them and they bear his image. They are not animals. You are not an animal this morning. You've never been just another animal, right? You are special in God's eyes. And though the world is, is telling us that we are animals and that we can act according to our instincts and our desires, and we, it's, we're just creatures and we can go and get whatever we want and take, and that's not what God made you to be. You reflect him like nothing else in this world. And he is jealous for you, and he wants to protect you and every other human, male and female, that bear his image. So that's just some introductory things to keep in mind as you study the Ten Commandments, particularly the, the last six. So let's get back to this idea of what God is prohibiting. What does God not want us to do? Um, um, in this one, it's pretty obvious. God doesn't want us to steal. But what does that mean? Uh, stealing is selfishly taking what doesn't belong to you and what you haven't worked for. Stealing is that easy. Taking what doesn't belong to you, what God has not given to you, and what you have not worked hard for. All right, let me give you some examples. Uh, the catechism covered some of those examples, and I'm just going to, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to kind of explain all of these examples, but I just want you to think because, and honestly, in, in all honesty, I, I sometimes think I'm not a thief. I don't steal. But as we read the rest of Scripture, and as we meditate on these things, and you'll see more as I go on, we are thieves. And I should say before I go on, this is going to hurt. Um, this is going to hurt. But that's, that's our physician. That's our healer. Uh, that our healer does not come into our lives and just give us a painkiller. He exposes our sins, he, and it will hurt but it's done in such a way that we would then be able to receive his cure, right? And the stuff that will take away that pain. So, citizens. Stealing includes uh, stealing money from the government, making false claims for disability and social security, 
um, or underpaying taxes, for example. Um, Jesus, by the way, was not against taxes. Um, religious leaders asked Jesus, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? They were trying to trick him, right? See if he could say something against the government. Jesus says, give to Caesar the things that belong to him and give to God the things that belong to him. Which, by the way, FYI, is everything, <laughs> right? God's stamp is on everything, so everything belongs to God. But, he, you know, how many of us know of people that have cheated on their taxes? I'm not saying you have to agree with those taxes, right? But if you're stealing from and taking, not paying your taxes, that's a form of stealing. On the flip side, governments steal all the time. They waste taxpayer money, right? They accumulate debt without really planning on repaying, all right? It is ironic to me um, that even as we're told not to, to pay our taxes, to pay our debts, that our own government is, is not doing that, but just on a bigger scale. And I'm not here to talk about the government, I'm just letting you know that, that robbing and stealing happens on every level in, in life. Um, one, <laughs> uh, one theologian said this, swindling the poor out of their meager possessions embezzling and mismanaging public funds, expanding one's territory unrighteously through war and the like, ordinary people commit petty thievery, but the stealing by political nobility on a grand scale, adorned with its splash and splendor, is still stealing. Compared to the kings of the earth, all others are but petty thieves. See, they're stealing that goes on on every level of human society individuals, families, communities, governments. There is no place where this commandment is not broken. Employees, filling in false time cards, calling in sick just to take the day off. We call in, we say, I'm sick. And then underneath our breath, we say, I'm sick of working here, right? <laughs> right? That's a form of stealing. Taking office supplies, wasting time at work, um, brothers and sisters, I'm not listing these because I haven't done these. I'm listing these because I have, and because I know, and I need to know that I'm, I'm, I'm breaking God's commandment. Wasting time at work, playing computer games, wasting time on Facebook, emailing friends, etc. Um, I'm not here to be legalistic. I'm here to let you know that the law of God must and does apply to every aspect of our lives. We can't not just turn a blind eye. If employees steal, do employers steal? Yes. Um, demanding longer work hours beyond your contract. How many times have you felt pressured by your boss to go beyond what they are paying you for? And then they don't pay you overtime. They don't even say thank you or reward you. It's a form of, the, of stealing when the employer does that to you. Uh, when an employer makes some employees do the work of two or more when others are fired. Hey, that's happening all the time, isn't it? You're, asked, you're being asked to do twice the amount of work, but you're not being paid twice as much, right? Uh, when employees or when companies, excuse me, when companies uh, don't disclose to the public and investors losses or manipulate earnings. Well, that's been happening a lot, hasn't it? <laughs> right? How many times have we heard, even in recent news, that the owner of a company knew that his stock would tank but didn't say anything, and before it went public, he sold his stock. Then it went public. Right? It happens all the time on a very big scale. Even false advertising is a form of stealing, right? How many times have you driven up to McDonald's and you look at the menu and you see this, oh, just amazingly delicious hamburger, right? It's just, you want to reach out and grab it and then you get it and, oh, that doesn't look anything <laughs> like what's on the menu. It doesn't even taste good, right? FYI, that's a form of stealing. False advertising. You're saying, I'm going to deliver something if you give me money, and then you don't deliver. 
This stuff is everywhere. And stealing and robbing is all over our society. Uh, stealing intellectual property, I talked about this already, right? People steal what belongs to others. They invented it, they designed it, they composed it, they wrote it. It's, that's stealing when you take that and use it as your own and don't give that person what they are due. Um, illegally copying or downloading books and music and videos, those FBI warnings mean something. There are laws for that, all right? Um, plagiarism, all right? Some of you have, are having to write essays and write book reports and all kinds of stuff for school and for, for college. Plagiarism is taking someone else's words and making them your own, all right? And if you do, if you do that without citing and giving them credit, that's a form of stealing. Identity theft, that happened to me. Someone got a hold of my social security number and was running around opening bank accounts with my social security number. That's stealing. Fraud, especially white collar crimes. I just have to name the name of Bernie Madoff and you know what I'm talking about, all right? Why is it that a rich person isn't satisfied with his riches and has to continue stealing? We'll get back to that, but just keep that in mind. Even slavery is a form of man or human stealing. Slave labor, sex trafficking, the buying and selling of people who are considered less than human and stealing their dignity and robbing them of their families and their loved ones. Um, discrimination and manipulation based on age and status and race, etc. These are all forms in which we deny people their God-given right to own the things that God has given to them. That we are saying you're not human. You are less than human. You are not someone who bears the very image of God. This is why God is so concerned about this commandment and the other six because we will take things from others for our own gain, things that we have not uh, worked for. And if, in describing these things, I've, I've kind of mentioned something that you've done. Um, the Bible calls you a thief. It calls me a thief. And that's hard because it's so easy for us to to want to give the label of a thief or a robber to those who have been caught and are put in jail or to those who do stealing on a big scale but not me the bible says yeah you too you're a thief but then even if you were to say well you know i'm not that bad and i haven't stolen and i you know i punch in i punch out i I, I, I don't think I've stolen what's not mine. This is where the positive aspect of the commandment comes in, too. And I will, I will say this. After studying the commandments and preaching through all of them and just reflecting on even the things that I studied years after, months and years later, it's usually in the positive aspect of the commandment that I find out that I've broken that commandment. Because I can convince myself that I have not stolen and try to justify all kinds of reasons why I took this and that and they didn't pay for it. But when God says don't do something, he's also saying do something. And when we don't do what we're supposed to do when it comes to this commandment, we're also stealing and we're also considered thieves before the eyes of a holy, perfectly moral, just God that is, is fighting for his image bearers and wanting to protect them, right? So that's another principle. When you come to a commandment that say, states something in the negative, you should ask yourself, God, what is God asking me to do? He's told me what not to do. What is it that I should do? So in this commandment, um, um, the, the positive aspect is throughout all scripture, but it's most clearly found in Ephesians 4.28, which we read earlier today. So uh, turn there now, go back to Ephesians 4.28. Um, in Ephesians 4.28, Paul uh, just very clearly shows us this principle in, in, in practice. 
Uh, he is writing to a church, to believers, right? He's writing to them, and as a good pastor, he's reminding them of the law of God, and he's not just reminding them of what they shouldn't do, but also of what they should do. So Ephesians 4, 28, he reminds them, he says, let the thief no longer steal. Okay, that's, that's the eighth commandment, don't steal. Ah, but there's more. It says, let the thief no longer steal, verse 28, but rather instead let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. God wants you to take those hands that were so quick to uh, steal from others, and he wants to redeem those hands. He wants to uh, change those hands instead of taking now to work hard, to labor, and to give away. Let's go through those very quickly. What does God want you to do? What does he desire? What does he command you to do through these verses? Um, through this commandment, excuse me. So you're supposed to work hard so that you're not tempted to steal. Second Thessalonians 3 says, If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, but not busy at work, but instead busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. God wants you to work. If you remember, as we read through Genesis 3, the curse that God gave to Adam was, was not like, Adam, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to work now. All right? That's not, working is not a curse. Adam was working before Genesis 3. He was taking care of the garden. He was naming the animals. He was made to work. What became a burden, what became a curse, was that his work would a lot of times feel like it was useless. And it would be hard. It would be toilsome, right? And it, it would just be painful, so that work was now changed into something that would be painful and full of suffering, but work itself was never meant as a curse. You were made to work, right? How many times do we, have we known or do we know of people that, that stopped working for whatever reason, and it just seemed like things got worse? Like they were so looking forward to retirement, and then when there's nothing to do, it's like, uh, you know, they, they're not as quick on their feet or in their minds. and That's because God wants you to work. I'm not saying that we all have to be out there doing construction, all kinds of stuff. But work is a good thing. All right? It's not a bad thing. And I know we need times of rest and, and we need times of refreshment. But God wants you to work. He wants to be productive to put your talents to good use. Ephesians, um, again, Ephesians 4.28 says... Stop stealing, start working. Stop stealing, start working. And he's writing to a church. And when he wrote to the Thessalonians, he was writing to a church. He said, I hear that some of you are just being idle. In that case, some of them were they're thinking, well, Jesus is going to come back any minute now, so why should I work? <laughs> why should I work? I'm just going to sit here and wait. All right? God says, no, you were meant to work. I created you to work. Get to it. God also is calling us to manage and take care of the things he has given to us. As I said already, everything comes ultimately from God and belongs to him. But we are not free to do with God's gifts whatever we want. They are a gift to us. We are to manage and take care of them. If you believe that God is truly creator of all things, that he rules and reigns and governs and owns all things, how can you mismanage? How can I mismanage the gifts that he's given to me? How can my heart not be convicted when I'm being wasteful, right? Wasting food or wasting resources or wasting my life and not using my talents for, for God's glory and the good of others. God says manage the things, right? He says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he might have something to take care of it so he might have something to share, which is the next point. 
God doesn't just say, stop stealing, start working. God says, stop stealing, start working, and share. That you would share with others, that you would share the blessings that God has given to you, and that you might even sacrifice for the sake of others. It says that you might have something to share with those that are in need, that those that are lacking something right now, that you would share. One pastor, his name is Jerry Bridges, um, says there are three basic attitudes that we have that humans have about possessions. He says, one attitude is this. When you say, what's yours is mine, I'm going to take it. That's flat out stealing, right? What's yours is mine, I want it, I'm going to take it. The other, the other attitude is, what's mine is mine, I'm going to keep it. God gave it to me, I'm not going to share it. It's another form of stealing, by the way. The, the attitude that the scripture calls us to consistently is this. What's mine is God's. I'm going to share it. What's mine is his. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to share it. This is God's way. Before we go on any further, I just want to ask you, are you working hard to manage and to share and even sacrifice what you've received from God? You can say, I'm not stealing, Pastor Chris, but are you working hard so that you might have something to share with others? Because when God's law comes and does its surgery on our hearts, we realize that even working hard and obtaining things, the American dream is not what God is calling us to. God is calling you to work hard so that you would have enough to share with others, that you would give it away, that you would be able to give it away. And if we don't, the Bible calls us thieves as well. Let me just say this. Um, yeah, that, that stealing is a result and not sharing is a result um, of an unsatisfied, an ungrateful, distrustful, impatient heart. That stealing and taking and not sharing and sacrificing is a result of a heart that is forever taking but is never satisfied with God or his gifts. Stealing is the result of a heart that is enslaved to the things that it's been given. The things that God has given you are now owning you. That stealing is a result of a heart, not sharing is a result of a heart that is owned not by God, but a heart that has now become owned and possessed by possessions. And God is calling you out of that. And at the very beginning of the Ten Commandments, God says, I am the Lord you got, your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God doesn't want you to be a slave to possessions, even good possessions, even blessings that come from him, because they are not God. They are just his gifts. And God's calling his people, calls you and me to come out of that. And the penalty that God establishes for stealing and for having a heart of a thief is this. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 10, God says, um, let's just turn there right now. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. So far, some of us would be thinking, I'm really glad I'm not on that list. I'm really glad that I'm not on that list of people that are not going to inherit God's kingdom. But then, in the middle of what we consider very messy and dirty sins, 
uh, Paul says not just idolaters or adulterers or homosexuals, but nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Three different ways Paul describes stealing and those that steal. Thieves, the greedy, i.e. those that don't share, the swindlers, those who trick people to get their money. On this list of 10 or however many sins and sinners, kinds of people that won't inherit the kingdom of God, three of those are, are stealers or thieves and robbers. And FYI, that, that's you and me. We're on the blacklist. On our own, we're on the blacklist. We're not supposed to inherit that kingdom because if we haven't stolen, we haven't shared. And none of us gets off the hook that easy. And none of us can point the finger to all these other sinners that seem kind of gross and kind of unholy to us and untouchable. The Bible points the finger right at us. The Bible talks about us. God only allow the, allows those that don't just refrain from stealing, but those that positively manage work and share and sacrifice for others. Those are the people that God allows into heaven. There's a problem, though, because that's not us. We haven't and we can't fulfill this law. The law of God is meant to break us, even as Christians. It's meant to break us of our righteousness, our, our self-righteousness, of believing that somehow we are better than other image bearers. So when we read passages like this and we study deeply and go deep into the Word of God, we realize, I'm a thief. I haven't shared. I've taken things from people that don't belong, things from people that don't belong to me. God requires that heart that doesn't steal, but also shares and sacrifices. And you and I have bad hearts. And we need better hearts. We need a perfect heart. We need God to do surgery. We need God to give us a new heart, to give us a heart transplant. Because if I don't steal, I'm not sharing, and I don't want to share, and little kids don't want to share. Uh, parents, I hope none of you have had to teach your kids how not to share. Right? If you ever wonder why you have to teach your kids to be good, it's because they already know how to be bad, right? You don't have to teach a kid to be bad. You give a kid a toy, and as soon as someone else comes asking for it, what does he do? No, it's mine. And not only does he pull away with his toy, but he's reaching for the other's toy, all right? I hope none of you have ever had to teach your kids that. But you don't have to. It's in their heart. It's in my heart. I want what doesn't belong to me, and I don't want to share. My heart is bad. Your heart is bad. And the commandment drives us to look at that heart and say, my heart's not good enough, Father. My heart is not good enough. I need a new heart. I need a perfect heart. Where can I find that perfect heart? And I know, and I hope you know the answer. That heart, that perfect heart is Jesus Christ's heart. And the Ten Commandments always drive us to him. Always drive us to ask, at the very least, who can possibly keep this commandment perfectly? Who is able, God? Who is able to not steal perfectly? Who is able to share perfectly? Who is able to sacrifice? God, this is impossible. And you are right, and I am right when we think that way. When we just give up because we can't fulfill this law not in ourselves. And it drives us to ask, God, is there any human, is there anyone who bears your image who can do this? And the answer is yes. His name is Jesus Christ. That Jesus fulfilled this commandment for you. That he didn't steal, but instead he shared and he sacrificed. That he obeyed in our place. It is by no accident, by the way, that Jesus spent most of his time with the poor and the spiritually needy that he was sharing even physically the little that he had. 
physically and that he was sharing spiritually all that he had spiritually because there were so many spiritually needy people around him. How many of those people that came to Jesus had been turned away by the religious people, the Pharisees, who said, no, you're not clean enough to come to God. Go fix yourself and then come, come see us. Jesus gave himself away for those people, shared with them spiritually. He worked hard. He ministered hard, right? He stewarded his gifts perfectly, right? He fed thousands while denying himself bread in the wilderness, right? He took little and he made a lot of it, and then he fed thousands, and he sacrificed himself. He sacrificed himself. Ephesians 5, right after the passage where, where um, Paul is encouraging and commanding the Ephesians uh, to not steal but to work hard, uh, Paul says this, that therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and did what? And gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Do you see in this verse, Paul is telling us that Jesus fulfilled this commandment for you. He gave himself for you. He fulfilled the eighth commandment for you by giving and sacrificing himself for you, for thieves like you and like me. That is a Savior that we serve. That's a Savior that we worship. That is the, the, the man, the image of God, made flesh, right? We're told he is the very likeness of God. He is the glory of God. And he came to fulfill the Eighth Commandment for you and to give himself entirely for you, for thieves like you and like me. We are reminded that Jesus died on a cross in your place between two, to what? Between two, what kind of criminals? Matthew tells us between two robbers, between two thieves. As Jesus hung on a cross, he was fulfilling this commandment, the eighth commandment, in your place. And there was a robber to his left and a robber to his right. And there was Jesus, not stealing, but giving himself, pouring himself out for them and for you and for me. Philippians 5, or 2 you can turn there with me. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 says this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul is telling us that Jesus did not, even though he was God, and, did not, and he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. An older translation of this verse says something to be taken or robbed or, or stolen. In other words, Jesus didn't hold on to his divinity and say, I'm not going to step down there on earth to save those sinners. There's no way I'm giving up heaven and community and fellowship with my Father and the Holy Spirit for those people down there. We are told that Jesus let go of heaven itself, let go of that perfect, uh, intimate relationship that he had with the Father, that he might come down here and share his life with us to the point that he was even forsaken momentarily by his own father. He gave that up. He opened up his hands. He gave that up, and he's had his hands nailed to a cross for you. I'll say it again. Jesus fulfilled this commandment for you and for me, and then he died so that we wouldn't have to be punished eternally for our sin of stealing and not sharing. Jesus died that he might give us that heart, that heart transplant. This day, 
I'll end with this, just a few questions. How is your heart? How is your heart? Are you owned by God? Do you believe that you belong to God and that you owe him everything? Are you owned by your possessions and the things that God has given to you? Are you holding tightly to the things that you think will bring you happiness and joy? You may say, Pastor Chris, I don't have a lot of money. That's, that's why I'm holding on to it. There's a reason why rich people still steal. Because all their money doesn't satisfy, and it won't satisfy you. You may think, I don't have a lot of money. But even if you had all the money in the world, you would not be satisfied. And you're still holding on to it. Not willing to share it. Not willing to give it to those in need. Not letting God be your owner. And instead, you've become enslaved to the things that you own. John 3.16 says this. For God so loved the world that he what? That he gave. This is how God loved the world. He fulfilled the eighth commandment. He gave up his most precious thing. He gave up his son for you. When you see that verse, I want you to see that God was keeping this commandment. And he loved you so much that he let go his son, his only son for you. Let me ask you again, where is your heart? Is your heart with the things of this world, even the good gifts of God, or is your heart with the God who gave up his son for you? If you're already a believer this morning, Are you sharing the things that God has given to you with others? Your possessions, your talents, your money, your talents, your home, your family. We oftentimes think that in order to give and to share, we have to follow a certain program, or there has to be a certain system, or that we have to pass around the plate. But God has given to all of us here things that we can share with others. Even a home can be shared with others. We can welcome the stranger in. We can share some of our family love with other people who are not, uh, who don't have family and who are not loved. We can share some of our time and some of our possessions with others. All right. The call is not here to give everything away. The call is here is to share. To share, because God's shared so much with you. And the call here, honestly, the call here is to share the most precious thing that God has ever given to you. If you're here today and you are a believer, it's because God has given you grace. God has given you Jesus Christ himself. Why don't we share him with others? Why don't we give that grace to others? Why are we stingy with grace? It's because we need God to continuously work on our hearts and to give that God, that God-given grace away, to give Jesus to those who don't have him. This is called evangelism. This is called loving your neighbor. This is called fulfilling the six commandments that deal with your neighbor. When you give God's grace away, I heard it put this way, are you a retention pond of grace or are you a river of grace? Is grace constantly flowing into you and then stopping with you? Or are you a river of grace where grace is coming to you through, from God and then being poured out into others. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is not an option, particularly for Reformed believers. If today you profess the doctrines of grace and grace alone, you are not to keep it to yourself. You have to share it. It's a commandment. It's not yours to keep. It's not yours to hide away. This grace is a gift 
that must be given because that's exactly what God did for us. God gave us grace. He gave it up for us that we might give it away to others. Let's pray.